Jesus reigns over all he reigns. We exalt your name. It's high above the heavens. Oh, we lift you high. We exalt your name. It's high above the heavens, Lord, we exalt your name, and all of creation sings praise for Jesus' reigns over all. Jesus reigns over all he reigns you reign we exalt your name we are high Sing your praise, we exalt your name. It's high above the heavens. We exalt your name, your name, your name. Let all of creation sing your praise. We exalt your name. Cause you're high above the heaven. Oh, we exalt your name. Let all of creation see our praise for Jesus reigns over. Oh, what 
you Lord and the words of the song was that we want to bring you the glory because we stand redeemed because of what you've done in our life Jesus nothing in ourself it's all that what you've done the price that you paid on Calvary and the things that the Holy Spirit continues to do in our life changing us from glory to glory so Lord we give you praise and and the way that we can praise you the most is with our life with our life bringing you glory the things we've been preaching about and talking about, doing things that you would have us to do so that we can have those crowns that cast at your feet, those rewards that we receive. So we just give them right back to you because you deserve it all, Lord. You deserve it all. And so we praise you tonight. We honor you. You're the reason we're here. I pray that you continue to bless everything that's done. Bless our, our brother Jonathan. I love him so much, and I just pray that you'd anoint him tonight, Lord, to speak a word to this congregation, Lord so that we would receive, Lord, and we would grow from this and learn uh, what's going on in Honduras and other things that he's got to share. So we praise you in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. I'm going to go ahead and ask Jonathan to come. And we're going to jump right into this because I know it's going to be good. I thank the praise team for the worship. And uh, we're just excited about what's going on right now. You playing a video? That's supposed to be going on right now? Okay, y'all tripping me out here. <coughs> Come on, bud. I do I do have a video. I want you guys to go ahead and fire the video I brought. It's just a couple minutes long. That'd be good.
So that term, Life Hope, is the organization that uh, started this work in, in Honduras, and then we, uh, we kind of took over in a lot of ways, and uh, they're still the original people with Life Hope that support, support tremendously, uh, but we've also expanded that, and of course that includes us. And so I just again say thank you. Uh, some of you maybe don't realize all that goes on in Honduras, and so the first part of this, I just want to give you a glimpse, and then I told Pastor Scott, my heart is full tonight to share with you, and so uh, I told him I was going to talk about 30 minutes, I lied, so you just hang in there, okay, uh, just kidding, I won't keep you all night, but uh, first of all, uh, when we started there in, in Honduras, one of the things that we had was uh, a feeding station, and that's still going on, and God's expanded that, we still feed about 150 kids uh, five days a week, and so part of your monthly contribution goes to support that, and there's several of our churches that are that are keeping that sustained. It costs about fifteen hundred dollars a month just for that, okay, just to sustain the feed ministry. And so, it's not only from monthly contributions of churches, but individuals have adopted children. And so, for ten bucks a month, if you're curious, for ten bucks a month, you can adopt a child, and that feeds that child for a month. We've got it down to that kind of science. Uh, from, from contributions on the Honduras side and from our local rotaries and things over there that are, that are working with us, um, we can feed those children for 10 bucks a month. And so if you want to sponsor a child, you see Pastor Scott, he'll get me your name and number and I'll get you signed up for that and help you do that for 10 bucks a month. And so even if it's just one, it makes a difference in that child's life. And so that's where it started. But the reality is what we understood and began to deal with there, doing medical clinics and eye clinics and, and, and dental clinics and feeding uh, that, those are all humanitarian things, and that's fine, but, but ultimately the gospel wasn't going forth like we really wanted it to. We really weren't making disciples, we were doing a lot of help, and then what happened was those people, when they'd see us coming, they, they'd come with their handout like this, because we'd become a handout crew. There wasn't any relationship, there wasn't any development of depth in that, and so, so we shifted philosophies. We're going to still feed the kids. But now most of the time when we go, we don't take anything. And they ask, what'd you bring me? And I'll tell them, I didn't bring you nothing. Nada. <laughs> well, what do you have? I have myself, and I have the love for you that God has given me, and I have the gospel, and we give you Jesus. And now we just, now we just build relationships. And there's been such a new depth that has been added and we do still have families we'll still give candy to the kids and still do a lot of fun stuff but when we do it it's on a relational basis we uh, some of the kids that you saw up there a lot of you guys that have been you you know them by name like David's the the famous kid he's got a, a foot that's practically inverted and and can't walk, but he is tough as nails and meaner than a striped snake okay when you meet David I mean he'll fight at the drop of a hat but he you know, I believe God's going to make him a preacher one day. He's, he's too mean to do anything else. All right. And so uh, if he can save Scott Mann and make him a preacher, he can make anybody. So I got hope for David. Amen. And so, uh, so no, we, we, you see those kids, you get to know them by name, and, you get, and, they, and they just steal your heart. Man, I see little dark skin and dark eyes, and, and man, my heart just, just swells. And so we, we've been convicted that ultimately we believe in these kind of situations. When you look at the New Testament model, ultimately when Paul would go in and plant a church, I'm sure some of those things happened. We know it happened because they were bringing the money and then they had deacons that were overseeing those ministries. And so the church was overseeing feeding the widows, helping the poor, those kind of things. It wasn't government assistance. It wasn't all these things. It's the church's responsibility from the New Testament to handle those things. And so in shifting philosophies from just doing humanitarian work, our heart is to plant a church there and in that church have a school have a bilingual school that teaches our children english and that already know spanish of course which gives them a foot up in the in the world that they live in to get jobs and to get better jobs there in honduras that that aren't available just to anyone and so we're going to give them education and in the midst of education we're going to give them the gospel and we ultimately want to see a culture change there See, in our village, what happened is the cartel was just up across the mountain, and that was one of their primary stations up there. 
And the cartel would come out of the mountains and the ladies in our village would prostitute themselves in order to make money. And in, and in doing that, of course, they'd get pregnant. So now we've got single moms with four, five, and six children with no man around at all. So these children don't understand father figures. They, these young boys don't know how to be a young man. All they know is about the thugs that come around, see their mom ever so often, and then are gone again. A lot of the children, you ask them, do you know your dad? And they say, I've never met my dad. Or maybe I've met my dad once or twice. And then the next time they see their dad is when they're given a phone call saying your dad's been killed or your dad's dead. We want you to come and, and visit your dad. And, and we were there just this past year, Stephanie and Moses. Moses uh, is one of the young men that we've become close to. He's an older boy there. And his sister Stephanie, they'd never met their father except one time when they were like five and six years old. The next phone call they get, they're 13 and 14 years old. The next time they see their father is in a box, and they had to travel to San Pedro Sula to see him. He's dead. That's a lot of the life that these kids have. And they don't have a father, but my, my God says I'm a father to the fatherless. And we want to introduce these children to the father to know them. They don't, they don't really know him. They know about him. Most people in Honduras are religious. They have like a Catholic background or they have some kind of religious background. And it's not a problem convincing them that God exists. It's just convincing them and helping them to see that God is good. And that God does love them. And even in their circumstances, there's hope and there's good news in Jesus that will never leave them nor forsake them. And even in the midst of trials and tribulations and suffering in life, they can have hope and peace. And a God that will supply all their needs according to his riches and glory. They need to know those things. So our mission has shifted from just humanitarian effort to really a gospel-centered mission. And then from being a gospel-centered, loving mission, we still do some of those other things. A lot of people ask, what do you do when you go there? And last time we did a lot of construction work and we did Bible school and you saw some of that. You know, New Vision really bailed us out. We were behind schedule. We'd had some rain and man, you guys jumped in there, some of you that was there and then some of you aren't here tonight. Man, dove in and, and did the dirty grunt work, man. Picked up shovels and shoveled dirt for hours, you know. Uh, I believe Lee could outwork any man that I've met, you know. <laughs> I mean, she can get after it. And, uh, and Stephanie and just so many. I mean, Jaden, you saw her packing the dirt and everything. Scott watched a lot, so don't let him fool you. Um, but the supervisors usually get paid the most. It's okay. And uh, no, but, uh, you did. You jumped in New Vision and made such a huge impact and called us back up. And so currently what's happening, we, we went back uh, here not too long ago. Um, we, our, our directors of, of Life Hope have met, and now we've been given the green light to go ahead and finish the whole building. We got walls up. And so hopefully, Lord willing, okay, when we get back down there this summer, what you'll see is floors poured and roofs on. And so I'm hoping, okay, uh, now that's, that's setting high hopes, but I'm hoping we'll get to be painting and st or stucco and painting and doing some finishing work when we get down there. But if not, the Lord's time is perfect and we'll do whatever's there. So, so a lot of times people ask, what are you going to do when you get down there? We're going to love on kids and then we're going to work at what's in front of us. That's one thing about these mission trips, uh, and, and maybe it's my personality some too, but these aren't like high structured person, the high structured mission trips. I mean, it's, it really is, like we tell folks, you know, people use the illustration, be like a rubber band, be flexible. We say no, rubber bands still have resistance, right? We say be like water, like Bruce Lee, <laughs> like water, you know, you just flow. Wherever the Holy Ghost flows, you flow, okay? And that may mean that we just stop and we're praying with someone, we may be preaching, we may be slinging mud, whatever, you know, but that's, that's just how this is operated and God has given us favor just to take our hands off the wheel and say, Lord, we trust you. We're, we're coming, we're committed to go, and Lord, you'll have the mission for us when we get there. So overall, that's the philosophy of ministry that we have. Some think, well, that's just kind of crazy to go that way. Well, I am convinced that Paul didn't know exactly what he was going to do when he got to go and where he was going. He just, just did what the Spirit led. So we want these trips to be Spirit-led trips. Uh, and, and so our heart in short-term missions is making a long-term investment. Does that make sense? So even though it may, we may be going for weeks or 10 days at a time, and, and we are trying to send four and five and six and eight teams a year now, which is great. It started out like one week a year out of 52 weeks, and you're not really getting a lot done. So now we're like eight and 10, uh, 12 weeks a year now. They're making impact. So like at least 
once or twice a quarter teams are going in and doing discipleship and doing those kind of things with folks. We're seeing more impact there. But we want to make a long-term commitment, even though it's short-term missions, to the same location. And as we do that, those relationships happen, trust happens, the gospel begins to go forth, and then cultures change. And so we hope to see that. That's what God's put on our heart to do. And so, so Honduras wasn't necessarily originally on, on our agenda. I know it wasn't necessarily on, on New Vision's agenda. I mean, we all had a heart for Haiti, and God used us in Haiti for years. And that's where I met your pastor, really got to know him. Uh, we, we both began uh, senior pastoring at the same time. Both of us had been in ministry before, but we both took our first lead pastor at church in the same year. Somehow I got fired from mine, and he's still at his. I don't know how all that works, but... Um, and so, but we're still pastoring, and that's pretty amazing uh, in itself. But I'll tell you a story about Scott. Me and Mike Devine were sleeping in a room over beside him, and somehow, you know, we got Scott over there in a room by himself because we couldn't hardly, you know, hang with him, but just so many hours in the day, right? And so, uh, so it's early one morning, and this place we stayed in, I'll be honest, it was one of the rougher places I've ever stayed in. I mean, I know I woke up a couple times, you know, big cockroaches on your chest and you know, and just, it was hot, the air conditions didn't work in this room, it's 100 degrees at night sometimes in Haiti, I mean, it's, it was just kind of a rough place, and so we'd already had like this sleep deprivation, we'd already had like spiritual warfare going on, and so we get up one morning, and Scott comes out of his room, and his eyes are like this big, he said, man, I'm going to tell you what happened last night, I'm like, what, dude, he said, a spirit of fear come in my room, he said, try to hold me down, but Jesus' name, I rebuked him, and I ain't been back to sleep yet. I thought, who in the world am I hanging out with on these trips, man? I mean, this guy's tripping. And, of course, I was really green in, in, in spirit world, you know, spiritual warfare, Holy Ghost, all those things. I mean, I was really green in a lot of those things. And these guys have discipled me through the years. And so I just, I just do. I love your pastor, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to share with you tonight what the Lord's laid on my heart. So, um, so before I, I move any further into our text, because I, 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 got, I got a word for us tonight that I really believe the Lord has just put on my heart more than just talking about Honduras. But I want to just give you an opportunity. Anybody got any questions about Honduras before we jump into the scripture tonight? Anybody got any questions? Can I kind of talk about what we're doing? Yes, sir. Do what? Their, their main religion, their main God is, is Catholicism, and so it's Catholic, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they have very much a works-based religion uh, it, it, there, um, and, and their roots are indigenous. They also have kind of an animistic religion, right, exactly, exactly right. So they believe if they're good enough, God will let them in, and so it's a, it's, it's a scary, it's a scary faith. Good question, though. All right. Other questions? Kind of hear what we're doing, what we're going to be doing, what we hope to happen, kind of our philosophy of how we go forth. Our main mission is to those children. We believe that's going to be our culture change. I, I didn't tell you about this. We helped the soccer team get started. That's been one of the ways that we've, we've really broken into the, the youth, the older boys that are there, and uh, they and they consider youth up to about 22, 23 years old. So we've got a we we've, we've built some good credibility with the 16 to 23 year old you know group. And so so as we're reaching those young men, they're not married yet, but we're we're helping cultivate a different culture in them about what it means to be a man, a godly man, uh, to love a wife, to to lead his household. And so that's also been a a good culture shift in the last probably 10 months. Uh, that has really developed in a in a breakthrough. So you can be praying for us in that as well. Um, well, look, if you've got any questions, please ask. Yes, sir. Uh, they don't. There's been one time we were there showing the Jesus film in the village late one night. And there were some pretty rough men that that kind of showed up and our drivers are really perceptive and especially then we were fairly new i'm i'm a lot more savvy now kind of recognizing those things so so that one night they they kind of showed up and sort of i don't think they meant harm to us but it would appear that they were kind of circling up our group and so our driver said okay it's time to go you know and they got us out of there like that quick 
The kids are very savvy. Kids take care of us. They, they know if there's houses that, that are kind of rougher, they keep us away from those places. But one thing that happened this past year with, um, with Trump putting some pressure and, and different things like that, they are the, the cartel pretty much all either got arrested or turned themselves in. They made Hawaii a, an asylum to be arrested in because what they did is the Honduras government opened season to all police forces to go after the cartel. And what that meant is they didn't say it in the news, but that meant dead or alive. And then Trump said, if you'll make it to Hawaii and turn yourself in, you can come to prison in America versus Honduran prison. And so they did. I mean, they, they left by the droves. And so I don't even, we don't even see the cartel no more. And how I know that that's working is, is you can go into our town and the little businesses like, like lumber yards and, and, and laundry mats and different places that was laundering the money, they're closed. They're closed down because cause the cartel's not there no more. <laughs> Amen? So, so that's, a, that's a big answer to prayer. And so we, we've never went in fear. We've been alert and we're wise. You don't go at midnight down a dark alley and, and hang out, you know. I mean, we're, we're wise in what we do. Uh, we're not foolish, but at the same time, guys, and I'm fixing to preach about that, man, we go with the spirit of boldness. We, uh, the, the song that we opened up with, man, the God of angel armies is with us, amen? And so people are like, aren't you afraid? Isn't San Pedro Sula really ranked high to, as one of the myrtle capitals of the world? Yes, it is. What well, used to be number one. I think it's fallen down to about number two or three now. Yeah, in the world, murder capital in the world. And God sends us there. Why? Because darkness has had a grip in this country, and God sends light to dispel the darkness. That's what 1 John says. Light always dispels the darkness. See, when you look at, look at the book of Matthew, and this is, this is going to be a very familiar passage, but I want to preach something to you that I learned here in, in just a few months back, okay? And this tripped me out when I heard this. Matthew chapter 28, at the end of the chapter there is what? The great... Say it out loud, the great, the great commission. This is right before Jesus is leaving, right before he heads out, and he gives a commissioning to his disciples. But what I didn't realize is there was fear even now in them. Look at this passage. I want us to begin reading in verse 16. A lot of times we start, the, the great commission is Matthew 28, 19, and 20, right? Go ye therefore. We start there, and a lot of times we don't look at context. But the context is absolutely crucial to understand what Jesus is saying to them here. Okay, So in verse 16 it says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But, look at these next two words. What? Some still had their doubts. I'm reading from the ESV. It just says, some still doubted. That's crazy to me, guys. Listen, these are the people that had lived with Jesus for three and a half years. These are the people that saw him open blind eyes, raise the dead. These are the people that saw him crucified and have now met the resurrected Lord. And now they're on the mountainside worshiping him. But yet some still are doubting. That word doubting, when you begin to unpack it, some still doubt he is who he says he is. They are still living in fear. Their faith is still weak. And these are people that have seen him face to face. They slept around him, ate with him, drank with him, day and night were with him, and still doubted. And man, when I saw that, man, it just leapt off the page at me. And the Spirit of God just spoke to me, why are you still doubting? I began to look and evaluate my life, and I became under such conviction when I read this, as I began to see the miracles of God throughout my life, of where I've seen God, and I've seen Jesus just intervene, the Spirit of God do miraculous things in my life, and yet I'm still fearful. I still have doubt. I don't walk in boldness like I ought to do. I don't walk in, a, in authority like I ought to do. I don't go out here and be the missionary that I ought to be, but that's changing. Why? Because the Spirit of God is showing me what the rest of this passage says. Now, I want you to, to deal with this tonight. Tonight, I desire to eliminate whatever doubts that you may have and who Christ is and His call on your life to be missionaries. 
Let's just start out this service this way. Say, I am a missionary. Go ahead and say it out loud. I am a missionary. One more time. I am a missionary. Now, I realized when I was growing up and I heard the word missionary, I thought about, man, you got to go to the pygmies in the deepest part of Africa and live in a mud hut and, and eat mosquitoes to survive. I thought, man, that's the only kind of missionaries that we can have. But no, listen, I want you to hear me. Maybe God's not wired you, called you to that foreign mission field. He has me, and I love it, okay? I've actually tried to go to the foreign mission field multiple times, and God's like, nah, I'm going to keep you here to stir them up, but I'll give you a taste of it every so often. You'll get to go some, all right? But he's not released me and my family to just to move, and we tried. We thought Honduras, we thought Haiti, we thought multiple places. Man, we're just, we're just out. Peace out, America. We're out. And sometimes I still think that way, <laughs> all right? But God's like, no. You can make more impact doing like what we're doing tonight, stirring up the church for the call of missions. And so some of you are going to have that. So I believe with all my heart, without trying to be overly prophetic, I'm not your pastor. I'm not trying to just, just coerce you or anything. But I believe with all my heart, God's going to send people out of New Vision Ministries to be foreign missionaries. I expect that. I expect that at a Vertical Life Church, the church that I pastor in. I expect that there's people going to come to us and sit down in our offices and say, Pastor, God has called us. We're selling out everything we've got, and we're moving. We love you. Will you support us? Yes, we'll support you. Praise God, and we'll weep, and we'll cry, and we'll hug, and we'll lay hands on, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, we'll send them. Amen? That ought to happen more often. That should, be, that should be the goal in our kids. I'll weep the day that I put a backpack on my son and send him to the mission field. But when that day happens, that'll be a sad day in an old daddy's heart, but it'll be the proudest day in a pastor's life. That's what we should desire for our children. Not to be just doctors and lawyers and go out here and get rich and be worldly. No, we ought to raise up men and women of God who have a heart to be a missionary. And then if being a missionary means that I'm going to go to the hospital to be a missionary as a doctor, then praise God for that. Or going to the school system as a teacher to be a missionary, praise God for that. Or to go into a foreign country as a missionary, then praise God for that. But we need to raise up a generation of missionaries that know Jesus. And they don't doubt. They don't doubt who he is. So tonight you may not have that heart for foreign missions. Maybe it's United States missions. Maybe it's Lincoln County missions. Maybe it's within your street or your block missions. But I want you to know if God has saved you, then he put his spirit inside of you. He's commissioned you to be a missionary. So say it with me again. I am a missionary. You didn't get it, so let's go again. One, two, three. I am a missionary. Now, be a good, to be a good missionary, you got to eliminate doubt. You with me? See, these guys now, later on, we know what happens on the day of Pentecost, and I'm not trying to, 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 to labor this too long, but we know there, there's doubting, but later Pentecost comes, they're filled with the Spirit of God, and, and you don't see these guys doubting no more. You see them take on hell with a squirt gun, if necessary, <laughs> laying down their lives for the cause of the gospel. And see, that's the advantage that we have. When they were first seeing Jesus here, they had the Holy Spirit. The Bible says Jesus breathed them on, the Holy Spirit came on them. They had anointing, they had empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But they didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that happens at Pentecost. But you and I do. You and I do. If you're a believer, you've got the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you need to die more in your flesh. The Holy Spirit takes over more. And we can talk a long time about Holy Ghost, and I'm going to talk some at the end about Holy Ghost. But let me tell you something. You're doubting because you lack feeling of the Spirit. And that's what was going on in their life. They didn't have a feeling of the Spirit, a fulfillment. They were still filled with a lot of flesh, a lot of doubt. Your doubt comes from flesh. Your doubt comes from lack of faith. Your doubt comes from fear, not from Spirit. Because God didn't give us a spirit of fear, did He? He gave us a spirit of love and a power and of what? A sound mind. I can think clearly. And a while ago while we was over here, man, God just birthed me just to continue in my doubt. Even standing before you tonight, I'm a little fearful, even though I shouldn't be. I'm a little fearful. I'm a little doubtful. Am I, God, am I really going to do this? Am I really worthy of this? Am I, can, am I capable of this? And the answer is, no, I'm not worthy. No, you're not capable. And you couldn't do this unless I put you here. But the fact of the matter is, God spoke into my heart. I sent you to this place tonight. So go up there and preach your heart out and I'll handle the rest. Amen? That's all God's asking. God's saying, hey, I'm looking for people who will believe in me. 
Not believe in themselves. I'm not here to boost your ego. You are nothing apart from Christ. And incapable and capable of nothing apart from Christ. But in Christ, there's nothing impossible. For I can do what? All things through him. So it just blew my mind when I read this, Pastor. I mean, they doubted. And I had never read that before. That's brand new to me. So Jesus, in the context of this, in the Great Commission... He is addressing their doubt. I want you to read it from that. He's not necessarily just commissioning them to go. He's addressing their doubt. Think about that for a second. And so tonight, let's address our doubts. Let's address our inadequacies. Because our adequacy is in Christ, as Paul said. Not in that of ourselves. So in addressing our doubts, number one, I want to be a person that without doubt, I go. Without doubt, I go. Now, now Jesus says this there, the the, the more familiar part of this passage in verse 19, the first thing he says is go. And, And to explain that just briefly, this is not a suggestion, but it is a command with assumption. It's not a suggestion, it's a command with an assumption. The command with an assumption means Jesus is saying, listen, my assumption is you are going to go. If you read it in the Greek and unpack that there, the command is, it's in a commanding way, go. But it's also saying, as you go. It's like when he talked about fasting. It wasn't like, well, if you feel like it and get around to it when you fast, do it this way. No, Jesus says, when you fast, do it this way. So in the assumption here is Jesus saying, now when you go. I have a lot of people all the time say, and I'll say, man, you, you really need to get involved in the mission. And they'll say, well, I'm thinking about it. Right, Tommy? Where'd Tommy go? Is he still in here? Huh? Where is he? Oh, he went to you? Good, I'll pick on him then. And he can watch the video later. No, I patted Tommy on the back a while back. And I said, Tommy, you need to go to Honduras with us sometime, man. We'll turn you loose with that guitar. And he said, I'm thinking about it. I said, Tommy, just read the text. It doesn't say think about it. It says go. Now, I get it. He may need to think about if God's really called him to Honduras or not. And he knows I'm picking on him. But ultimately, listen, going as a missionary is not an option. It's a command. And a command with an assumption. So as you're going, and as you're going through those natural rhythms of life, that's what we were talking about back there in the meeting before that, that I just kind of crashed in on, but it was just a God thing. I mean, that's, that's our heart. We need to raise up church families that as you're going, wherever you live, wherever you work, and whether, where, wherever you play, you're a missionary. I want you to just to, to, to begin to indoctrinate yourself with that mindset that where I live, in my home, I'm a missionary. And in my neighborhood, I'm a missionary. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I'm an image bearer of Jesus right where I live. When I go to the grocery store, I'm in a mission field. And bless God they need it in the grocery stores. Amen. We're on the mission field. And so many times we're just running through life and we've missed Jesus' assumption over those that are followers of him over those that are disciples his assumption of us is that we're going in his name everywhere you go everywhere where's the mission field it's not in here the sanctuary is a refuge for believers it's a refuge for believers now i get it it's great when unbelievers come it's great when we see somebody walk the aisle and get saved on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night or meet in the pastor's office and God saves them. That's wonderful. Praise God for that. But that is not God's plan A for the church. Not belittling that, but what is God's plan A? It's Jesus' assumption over his people that you're going to go in my name. It's not come and see. See, that was the Old Testament model. That was Solomon's temple and all the gold and all the glamour and all the, 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 the huge structures and the, the Ark of the Covenant and all of those tremendous glamorous things. That was built to come and see the glory of God. But what happened when Jesus said it's finished? The veil was rent, the Holy of Holies was opened up and now the new covenant is go and tell. Any of you ever been growing up on that old song? Go tell it on the mountain. Right? 
tell it. Go tell it. Wherever you live, work, or play. Then the second thing, Jesus, with his assumption that you're going to go without doubt, he's saying, stop doubting, I'm sending you, go. Without doubt now, stop your doubting. When you go, i got a couple things I want you to do. Now let's make sure in this command, and I, and I meant to say this earlier, let me insert it here. If a king gives a servant an order, how many of those servants disobey the king? And if they disobey the king, what are the consequences? And is this not the king of kings and the Lord of lords that has told us this? The king above all kings. And, in, and this king did not come to coerce us or lord over us, but died for us. The reason I want to insert that here is because these next two things that I tell you, if we're not careful, we'll just do it out of legalism, just out of obligation. That's not what this is about tonight. See, when Jesus tells us to go, it's not out of just obligation, just out of legalism, just out of, well, I just guess now it says go, so I have to go do this. No, it's we get to go do this because our king of kings commanded us from a position that he died for us. And he took wicked people, and even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loved us. And so now Romans 12 really comes to life when it says it's just a very reasonable thing. I like the King James Version in that text. It's just a, it's just a reasonable service to be a living sacrifice. That's not even radical. David Platt wrote a book, Radical, and now that I understand the gospel more than I ever have, and I'm still growing in understanding the gospel, David's book, or really David Platt's book, really ought to have been just wrote reasonable. It's not radical to sell everything you've got and move to Africa. That's just reasonable in comparison to the cross and the resurrection and the life we have. It's not radical for you to love your neighbor as you love yourself in comparison to what Jesus has given us and the salvation and, and eternity that he's going to give us. It just becomes reasonable to say yes. Whatever you want, Jesus, yes. It's just reasonable. So now the reasonable thing that our king says is, I want you to go, and as you go, without doubt, I want you to make disciples and I want you to baptize them. It's not hard, right? Listen, now that's messy work. That's the problem in our churches today, and it's a problem with church people today. To make disciples is messy. I'm learning that more than I ever have. I've got the opportunity right now in the life that God's given us to pastor in my dream church. We don't have, at this point, and if we do, we'll just deal with it, but at this point, we don't have any power struggles. We got no politics. We got no big me's and little you's and those kind of stuff. What do we have? Messy, messy, messy people. We've got drug addicts. We've got prostitutes. We've got broken families. We've got adulterers. I mean, whatever the list you want to list, you know, when you start looking through our congregation, it would like really, huh, oh, wow, that you used to do that? <laughs> And they'll say, yeah, I used to do that about three weeks ago. It's messy. It takes an inordinate amount of time to disciple people coming out of those things. It takes an incredible amount of resources to support those people coming out of those things. It takes an incredible amount of patience that sometimes wears very thin in my life when those people keep doing stupid things. Ain't that your pastor's word, stupid, Right? Okay, good. I'm glad. <laughs> Sanctification does happen. Amen. I'll say it. They do stupid things. It is that some things are just stupid. Why would you do that? But I still do stupid things too. It's messy. And training those people, not just to believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sins and rose from the dead, but to train them to walk in the spirit and not walk according to the flesh to train them in the doctrines of God's word and the scriptures, it's messy and takes time and takes energy and you become exhausted. But is that not exactly what Jesus did? 
took messy people and made them into saints? Is that what he did? And then he says, when you take those messy people and you disciple them, you disciple them. This is your job now. You go make disciples. He did not tell us, go build huge facilities. He did not tell us, go make great worship bands. He did not tell us, go buy lots of church vans and park them out here and don't ever use them. If I'm stepping on your toes, I don't mean to, okay? Because I'm not talking to you. We get to ride in your church vans every now and then, amen? But whatever the list you want to make of what American church has become, it's become the very opposite of what Jesus told us to do. And our ministries and our focuses and the things we do are organized to pamper Christians rather than to make disciples. Now that, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of your ministry, so I can say that with a very clear conscience and a clear heart without being like condemning. That's why I'm not your pastor here tonight. I'm your evangelist here tonight. Amen. And I hope you do this. I promise I did not interview Scott to find out if you did or not. I will later. Amen. But if your ministries are just designed to pamper Christians and to pacify and to meet your preferences and to make you feel good and to make you feel happy, you went right the opposite of what Jesus told us to do. To go into the world, into darkness, for you are the light of the world. Go out into darkness and make disciples and baptize them. And that baptism that he's talking about there is talking about their old is gone, break them into new people. That they're buried with Christ and baptism, resurrected to new life. Amen? That's our job. That's our commissioning. That's our command to go. And Jesus is saying, it's going to be messy, so stop your doubting. I'm sending you to do this. Now, honestly, that's overwhelming. It really is, is it not? I mean, seriously, think about what I just told you to go do. And not me, but Jesus. Just think about what Jesus is telling them to go do. you got 11 guys standing on a hillside, and he said, now go into the, all the rest of the world. Head out, guys. And they're like, what's that mean, Jesus? The city that I pastor in now is in Newton, North Carolina. Newton, North Carolina has become identified as Pocket 82. The Baptist State Convention did a study through all the cities of North Carolina and identified the top 100 most lost cities in North Carolina. Pocket 82 is Newton, North Carolina. 67% of my city does not know God. 67%. You start doing the math on that, that's several thousand people and I pastor in a church that runs about 200 right now several thousand people that's overwhelming Catawba County is fifth in the nation I want you to put that in your mind try to wrap your mind around that for a second of all the hundreds of counties in the states in the nation Catawba County is fifth in the nation for the opioid epidemic. Fifth in the nation. And God has said, go do it. They're over at the clinics, that's right. Legalized opioids. Is that the answer? No. And so ultimately, we've got a real problem. Lincoln County, I can't remember exactly the number, but Lincoln County is, is I think it's pocket 102. I think it is. Can, we, can, I, can I answer your question in just a second? Let me, let me, let me finish this thought. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 
That's a lot. Yeah. Right. And so my point is, though, here in Lincoln County, I think out of the all the cities in North Carolina, I think Lincoln County's like just out of the top 100. It's like 102, I think it is, if I'm not mistaken. So between our two cities, we're practically within the top 100 of all the cities. I think there's like 400 or 500 in the state of North Carolina. Most lost places in our state. And let me ask you a question. How many churches do we have in Lincoln County? How many churches do we have in Catawba County? I mean, dadgummit, you can have a church around every corner. And the problem is this. It's not the problem of lack of churches and not the problem with lack of people say, well, I'm a Christian. It's a lack of missionaries. It's a lack of people that have stopped doubting and go in the authority that God's given them to make disciples and baptize them. It's a lack of people that's saying, hey, wherever I live, work, or play, I'm going to go after this. And it's a group of people that's lived by fear. So Jesus has put you here in Lincoln County to do this new vision. He's put Vertical Life in Catawba County to do this. And he's put other brothers and sisters that we ought to link arms with that have like-mindedness to be missionaries. And we link arm in arm for the cause of the kingdom of God. And we go after those that are far away. And we make disciples and we baptize them. But even then, we can be all fired up and bold. But that's still scary, right? I can sit in my office and become overwhelmed. I start mapping things and making these strategies and, and all this kind of stuff that, that we do sometimes. And you start walking through meetings and you start doing those things together there when sometimes. And you just you have leadership meetings and you get a little overwhelmed. And, you know, and I get like these knots in my stomach. And I, I'm just like, God, really? And, and so I'm, I'm awake at night and, and I'm, I'm nervous and I'm anxious. And I'm like, how are we going to afford this? And how, how, how we don't have enough people to do this. And we don't have enough leaders to do this. And we don't have enough facilities to do this. And we don't have enough counselors to do this. And the Lord's like, would you just shut up? Their doubts were beginning to eliminate their mission. And, and, and you can see, just hear, can't you hear it when Jesus said, hey, I want you to go into the rest of the world and make disciples, and I want you to go tell them all the things that I've taught you, and I want you to go baptize them. And can't you see Peter's wheels start turning in his head like, <laughs> what, you're leaving? You just got back here not too many months ago, and, and now you're, you're leaving again, and now you're telling us to go do this? Hold on, Jesus. Don't you remember what was happening when the, the last time I was confronted, you know, I, I let you down big time. And, you, and, and you're telling me to go do this? And their doubts begin to just overwhelm them. Now listen to what Jesus says to eliminate their doubt. And tonight, let this be the, the thrust of the spear that eliminates your doubt. Jesus said, and I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you all the way to the end. He said, I'm, I'm never going to leave you. I'm always with you. Now, if we, if we take that real lightly, he says, I'm, I'm going to be with you. What does he mean by that? He's stirring them up to some pretty big stories and pretty big text. So let me just march through a few of these. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, he's telling them, when you pass through the waters, I'm going to be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. He's taking them back to a guy named Joshua. And, he's, and where God told Joshua, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. He's taking them back to where Isaiah said again, so do not fear, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. He's taking them back to a guy named Daniel, who was a prophet, who was told, don't pray. But Daniel said, I can't stop praying. And he went into the lion's den, and God shut the mouths of the lions when, when he should have been Eli. That shouldn't be called the lion's den. It ought to be called Daniel's den, because he went up and curdled up to some of those lions. And some of you are looking at the lions in your life, afraid to speak the gospel, because you're afraid they're going to eat you. But raise up, old Daniels of today, and speak the word of God. And Watch how he shuts the mouths of the lions. 
He's taking them back to guys like the name of Noah. And there was a flood coming. And Noah's building an ark. And there's people standing outside. And Noah preaches for a hundred years. And some of you have been preaching to your neighbors. And you're like, God, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. God says, keep on preaching. Because there is a flood coming one day. And the wrath of God will be poured up on this earth one day. And those that are in the ark of Jesus Christ will be saved. And Noah found favor with God. And he was saved from the flood. He's taken them back to a guy that was named Moses. And Moses had a, had a speech impediment. Whatever that was. Whether he, he couldn't talk plain. Or, or whether he had a lisp. Or he stuttered. Whatever it was. He said, God, I can't, I can't even speak well. And God said, I'm going to send you face to face with the most powerful man in the entire world. The man God named Pharaoh. And you're going to stand before him. And you're going to declare to him to the God of this world. Let my people go. He's taken them back to that man, Moses, who stood up to the forces of evil. And today, where's the modern day Moseses that will look at the devil in the face and say, let those people go in the name of Jesus. He's taken them back to a little boy named David who had a huge Goliath standing on the battlefield taunting him. And David's looking around and says, where's the army of God? I'm wondering sometimes, not that I'm in all of David, but sometimes I'm just wondering, where is the army of God? Where are the people of God that are filled with the Spirit of God, that are unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God into salvation? Where's the army of God that's going into spelling darkness? I want to be a part of that army. I want to be a man of God that is without doubt and without fear, and that is courageous and bold. I want to be a man of God that's like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that even if it puts my life in jeopardy, and I'm going to be thrown into the fire, I'm not afraid and I have no doubt because there's always a fourth man walking in the fire with us. Amen? I want to be that kind of man with that kind of faith and walk without fear. I want to walk into the places that God calls us to go in Honduras, and I don't care if it's cartels or drug lords. Or, or pimps and prostitutes that God is with us Jesus is with us and the demons fear and tremble him these aren't just fairy tales or images of history but they are more Jesus telling us stop your doubting See, those people there standing on the hillside with them, they still doubted. Some of you have been saints and born again for a long time, and yet you're still wallowing in your fears and doubts. Stop it. You belong to the Son of God. God gave you to Him. John chapter 6, verse 36. And all that God gives to Jesus will come to Him. And whosoever comes to Him, He's not going to turn them away. But you're going to become sheep of his fold. And you are under the good shepherd. And even in a table prepared before me in the presence of my enemies, my head is anointed with oil. You're anointed with the Spirit of God to do this work of God. See, this is God's mission. Who was the first missionary? God for God, even before the foundations of the world, looked throughout the eons of history and said, my children are going wayward. And I'm going to go rescue them. I'm going to go save them. And I'm going to send my son that he will rescue my people from their sins. And then I'm going to make him the firstborn, Romans 8, of, of many brethren. That I'm also going to send them to live out the legacy of my son and the earth for my glory. That's God's mission. So, in conclusion, and making an application of why we should not fear, I'm going to try not to chase a rabbit, but keep it really plain. A lot of people ask me all the time, Pastor, do you still believe in the works of the Holy Ghost? Do you still believe in signs and wonders? Do you still believe in the miracles? You better believe I do. But why aren't we seeing them in the church? I want you to track throughout history where those things happened. Where did it happen for Philip? Was it not when Philip left the comforts and the walls of the church and went into a Samaritan town and began to preach the gospel? 
Where did it happen in Paul's life? Was it as Paul and Peter and John got to having a powwow in Jerusalem? Was there like all these miraculous signs happen? No, not at all. It's when Paul left and went to Ephesus and went to Corinth and began to be a missionary. And as he preached the gospel, God did miraculous things. Where did it happen in Peter's life? Peter was up there on the rooftop talking and with God and having a vision. Where did it happen in Peter's life when God sent Peter to the ungodly place of a Gentile's house called Cornelius? And when P- Peter showed up to preach the gospel, guess what happened? Before he could even get finished preaching, the Spirit of God fell in that house and the whole household got saved that day. You want to see the Spirit of God move. You want to see miracles happen. And you want to be empowered by the Holy Ghost. Then get about God's mission. But if you want to live a powerless life and a weak life. And just fumble through life as a so-called Christian. Then just be a Sunday morning attender. There's a major difference. And we've reduced our Christianity down to whether you attend good Sunday morning services. You tithe and maybe you go to Bible study once or twice a week. That's not Christianity. That's not the mission of God. And he saved you for far more than that. He has filled you with his spirit for far more than that. He has called you to go be missionaries. Missionaries. On his mission. So would you say it again? I am a missionary. And if you have any doubt about being a missionary, just come right back here. If you have any fears about being a missionary, wherever you live, work, or play, just come right back there. Because even as bold and loud as I'm yelling at you tonight, I still get afraid. I still know my inadequacies and I know my failures. I know my weaknesses and my inabilities. Very keenly aware of them. God says, I'm aware of those things also. And that's where in your weaknesses, I will shine forth. See, that's what that text means. In your weaknesses, my strength, his strength becomes perfected in this. He says, I know your weaknesses. That's why I put this gift into jars of clay. Weak, fragile things that the world will know that the power that we do these things did not come from us, but from him. That's 1 Corinthians. So don't worry about your weaknesses. And don't be overcome by your doubts. But we are missionaries. Called, commissioned, anointed, and empowered. And never alone. Let's pray together tonight. Father, I just pray that you would help us respond with a grateful heart for the calling on our lives. Lord, I know that tonight took more time than I had initially planned, but I'm thankful for this message because it is preaching to me. And I hope that it's resonating with this, your people here tonight. I'm thankful for this church, God. And I would ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would empower this group of people to be mighty missionaries in your name. I pray, God, that you'd use this church To shine light in Lincoln County and dispel darkness. To go after the unlovable. To save the unsavable. For that's who you are. To rescue the perishing and the dying. And in Jesus name. Bring them to life. To relationship with you. God we thank you for this commissioning to make disciples. We thank you that in this text we can dispel all doubt. Ultimately, you could have dispelled all doubt by just saying, you're with us. (laughs) That does it. But if you're for us, and you're with us, what can compare to that? Who could be against us? So make us bold and courageous, I pray. Fill us with faith. Extinguish our doubt. We give you glory and honor in Jesus. Just turn them all on. There you go. That was a word right there, church.
expect more than what you know because the direction that we're headed is exactly what he's talking about. This, is, this small group stuff is exactly making disciples, going out in the community, living community, being in the community, and being Jesus to all these people that we see all the time. It's exactly the direction we're headed. So this was just more than the heart. This was a whole lot more than that. So just give me confirmation. And I know Laura and Corey's probably jumping out of their skin too. So, because uh, that's what we've been talking about is doing this. So, uh, God's going to move. Amen. Jonathan, thank you. That's that's awesome. I don't get to sit there and listen much, but that was powerful, man. I could have stayed here till 1030. Wouldn't have mattered to me. You want to run them out and you preach to me some more? I'll be good. If you'd have said Gideon a few minutes ago. I was waiting for you to hit Gideon on the not be afraid. If you would have, I'd have fell out on the floor right there. <laughs> All right. All right. God bless you guys. Don't forget the Honduras team. We're going to go to the kitchen and meet. Um, and, and one more second. T Friday night, we're having a night of worship here. I didn't announce it earlier. Make sure you tell everybody. Everybody's invited. It's going to be a night of worship. Our praise team's going to lead us. So please spread the word at work and wherever else. If you got some people you've been talking to, sharing with, maybe they won't come to a traditional service or a regular service, which we ain't traditional, but get them to come. Man, night of worship. Gonna, uh, door's going to open at 630. We're going to start worshiping at 7. God bless you. Love each other before you leave, and uh, we'll see you in the kitchen of Honduras team. Thank you.